Hello, brothers and sisters of Christ. I wanted to start off this study with a song, if I can, an old hymn. It's called Softly and Tenderly. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, he who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. See, so why do I want to start with that one? Today, brothers and sisters in Christ, there's a lot of hymns that talk about us getting to go home and be with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, our study is going to be on another part of the armor of God, the helmet for a hope of salvation. And second, turn to Ephesians 6.10, that's where we're going to start. But in 2 Timothy 2, chapter 2, verse 3, we read, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. As we get into this study, we're going to start, we're going to talk about the helmet. Of salvation. What is the helmet of salvation? We're going to talk about what does it mean to put on the helmet for a hope of salvation, and we're going to I'm going to go through some of the scriptures to remind us what's ready, what's really waiting for us up there in heaven. What does it really mean to be looking for that blessed hope? Okay. But notice it says endure hardness. Right now we're here. Right now, brother, says Christ, you and I we're here. Okay, we're going to have to endure hardness as a good soldier. Okay, and one of the things that's going to try to pull us away from keeping our eyes on the coming of Jesus Christ is the affairs of this life. So I wanted to read that. We need to be, make sure that our, what we were created for, brothers and sisters of Christ, we were created to please God. The Bible says, for thy pleasure they are and were created. We were created to please God. Okay. Psalms 147, we read, O God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation, thou hast covered my head in the day of battle. And there's a spiritual battle going on today. Remember what the Bible says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's why the Bible tells us to put on the whole armor of God. And that's where we're going to get into Ephesians 6. One of the things, he's, um, Ephesians 6.10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power is might. Finally. One of the last things he tells the, the church at Ephesus is this is very important. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power is might. Verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It's one of my memory verses. I have it highlighted green here. But that's what we wrestle against. If you're going to wrestle against, uh, against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, you need to be putting on the whole armor of God. Okay. Verse 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and have done all to stand. What's one of the biggest things we're fighting in these last days? The Bible talks about the falling away. There are brethren that are falling. We're in a war, and it's like you're running down the battlefield, and poof, there goes a Christian falls. Poof, there goes another Christian fall. Poof. All these bullets that have to do with the affairs of this life, um, lo uh, lovers of flesh, or uh, lover, I'm sorry, Lovers of, of pleasures more than lovers of God. That bullet hits somebody, poof, they go down. Um, spoiled by philosophy, poof, someone goes down. Spoiled by vain deceit, poof, 
Another Christian goes down. Spoiled by traditions of men. Another person goes down. Spoiled by uh, rudiments of the world. Another Christian goes down. The love of money. It's the root of all evil. A bullet hits them. Another Christian goes down. The Bible says that um, when it comes to the love of money, it's the root of all evil. While some have coveted after, they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. We're seeing Christians drop. Why? I think one of the biggest reasons why in these last days is you're not putting on the whole armor of God. You're being talked into taking off pieces of the armor of God. And I believe in this study, when we get through it, the first piece of armor that you're being talked into taking off is the helmet for the hope of salvation. There are brethren today that are teaching that Jesus isn't coming back any day. They used to, but they don't teach that anymore. I don't believe Jesus is coming back any day. I believe he's coming back in 10, 5 years, 10 years, 20 years, maybe in the next lifetime, next um our next, uh, how do you say it, our children, or our children's children, they're trying to get you to take off that helmet for a hope of salvation. And we'll get into that. Okay. Verse 14, stand, therefore. Remember the Bible is always telling us we need to stand, stand, don't faint, don't falter. Striving together. We need to be putting on the whole armor of God. We've already talked about this in our last study, but um, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. Girt about with truth. Loins girt. And we did a whole study on it, girding up your loins. It's not a belt. That's, that's, a, that's a falsehood. It's not a belt. It's an action. When it says having your loins girt about with truth, you look up how to girt up your loins. Okay. It's an action. It's something you do when you go to work. It's something you do when you go to war, fight, battle. Okay? So they're actions. And that truth that it's talking about is the Word of God, the sword. And having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. And we're going to get into these other pieces eventually. But here's the one we're talking about today. And, taken, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The first piece of armor that, they try, that I believe they're trying to get you to take off or put down is your shield of faith. Second one is always going to always, always, that follows the shield of faith is the helmet for a hope of salvation. Your faith that Jesus is going to come back any day now to take us home. He steals that from you. Satan does. He gets you to take down your sh the, the, the shield, and then the darts come in, headshot, boom, takes you out. Like I said, people fall. Poof, poof, poof. They forget that we're running a race. The Bible, Paul talks about how we're supposed to run the race as if one received the prize. Now, everybody's going to have their own rewards at the judgment seat of Christ, and we'll talk about that. But you're to run as if only one received the prize. That's how you're supposed to be that motivated and that, I want, I want that prize, Lord. I need to get busy living for you. You could come back any day now. All right. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Take the helmet of salvation. People say, helmet of salvation. All right. What is this helmet of salvation? Is it means that, oh, it's when you get saved, you automatically have it on, right? When you get saved, you, you repent, you believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, you confess both in prayer and you ask God to save you, and you automatically have it on. Then why is he telling Christians to put on the whole armor of God? People that are already saved to put on the whole armor of God. This salvation here is not talking about eternal salvation. What's this salvation talking about? Turn to 1 Thessalonians 5.1. 1 Did I do this wrong? Oh, that's second. First Thessalonians 5.1 Thessalonians 5.1 but of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. 
You've got brethren out there that are trying to say when Jesus is coming back. And they're also trying to say when Jesus can't come back. We're going to talk about that. Okay. He couldn't have come back then, and he couldn't have come back at this time, and he couldn't have come back at that time. The Lord cometh as a thief in the knife, night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as propelleth upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. And I've talked about this, Brother Shrek, as the world gets wickeder and wickeder, our light is supposed to shine brighter. We're supposed to be set apart from this world. And you've got brethren that get that getting shot down. And they go to looking like the world. They don't shine that bright anymore. Okay? We're children of light and the children of the day. Jesus is supposed to shine through us. We belong to him. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as, uh, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Watch and be so Watch what? We're going to get to that. And it says be sober. We're talking about being a soldier for Jesus Christ. Once again, the Bible says be sober, be vigilant for your adversary the devil roaming around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He can't prevent you from getting saved, but once you get saved, brothers and sisters in Christ, he's going to do everything he can to mess you up and make you as useless as a Christian as possible. He's going to get you to try to not shine as much. He's going, to he's going to get you to take off that helmet for a hope of salvation so you're no longer looking for Jesus Christ with the life that you're living. And I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. 7. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. There's lost people. I understand that. There's the Jewish people that they're, right now, uh, the Bible talks about how in blindness in part has happened to Israel. Okay, there's those people that are sleeping. But also there's the people, uh, the brethren, the falling away. Brothers and sisters Christ, people that have fallen, they're sleeping. They're not being sober. They're not being vigilant. They're not watching. It's like a soldier that has a post. You've got to watch throughout the night, and you're waiting for a certain person to come in the morning or throughout the night. You don't know when they're coming, but they're coming. So you're at your post. You're supposed to be watching, and you're supposed to be sober, and you're supposed to be vigilant. You don't know when Jesus Christ is coming back. Verse 8, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. Now, we'll get into this in, in, when we do the breastplate of righteousness. But you say, well, it's the breastplate of righteousness. Faith is counted to us for righteousness. Okay. And love, Jesus said, if a man love me, he'll, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. This is still talking about the breastplate of righteousness, brothers Jesus Christ, just in more detail. And for a helmet, the hope of salvation. See, when we get saved and born again, I don't have that. I don't need that hope of salvation. It's given to me. It's a gift from God. But that blessed hope, when it says, now you are sealed unto the day of redemption, that being sealed is the blessing, and the hope is that someday we'll be fully redeemed. This body right here has not been redeemed. My soul has. My spirit has. But this body has not been redeemed yet. It's still wicked. It's still vile. I still have to put it down every day. Right? The helmet for the hope of salvation. So what is this salvation talking about? Well, we've already said it, the catching away of the body of Christ. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. Remember up the top where he said the perfect that they come day come as a thief in the night. It's talking about how we're supposed to watch and be sober. It can happen any day. We're supposed to be watching for it. And you have brethren that have turned their back on this. And it's a hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. When he's pouring out his wrath in the time of Jacob's trouble, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Verse 10, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, I believe this is talking about the dead, and Christ shall rise first. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but the dead in Christ rise first. We should live together with him. 
Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another even as ye do. It's a comfort to know that Jesus Christ could come back any day now. And that we're supposed to stay sober, we're supposed to stay vigilant, we're supposed to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ with the life that we're living. And it's a comfort to know that any day now God could call me home, either through death or through the catching away of the body of Christ. It's a comfort. It edifies one another. Okay? It's a motivator to motivate you. Okay? 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 13 reads, But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. How many times have we had a brother in Christ that passed away and went to be with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and we sorrow after him. We miss him. We want. To, we miss that brother in Christ. It strengthened us, and we strengthened him. Iron sharpens iron. Bible talks about. We miss that brother in Christ. But remember, we have hope. We're going to be together again someday. We are not without hope. It says here, even as others which have no hope. You know what separates us from the lost world? Turn to Ephesians chapter two. The biggest thing that separates us from the lost world. Ephesians chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus on two good works. The easy believism hate reading verse 10. They love to read verse 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves is a gift of God. Okay? Not of works, lest any man should boast. See, see, it's not of works, not of works. But after salvation, what happens? Verse 10. For we are created, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus on two good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh. Romans chapter 8 talks about being carnally minded and walking after the flesh in, in your lost state. You're carnally minded and you're walking after the flesh. What's the difference? We are now capital S spiritually minded, walking after the spirit. Okay. Who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. No hope and without God in the world. So what makes us different from the lost world now? We have hope. We have God in us, the Holy Spirit, and we have hope, that blessed hope. We're going to get to that blessed hope. Having no hope and without God in the world. Now understand there, once again, I have to always point out, it's bringing up Israel. Why? Because this Ephesians is not written to Gentiles only. It's written to the church at Ephesus. Are there Jews present at Ephesus? Yes. Okay. And we get adopted in. Okay, we got that spiritual, spiritual circumcision made without hands. Okay? We get adopted into the Jewish people, and we now get to share in the inheritance. The promises. Verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances. Remember we talked about, when we talked about Colossians chapter 2, what are the ordinances there? They're the Levitical laws. And they were nailed to the cross. You had, in the Old Testament, you had to keep the commandments of God, and you had to, circumcision and the laws of Moses. It's the laws of God, but the Jewish people always look at it as the laws of Moses. Okay. You had to keep those in order to be saved. And nobody could keep them. 
That's why there was Abraham's bosom. That's why nobody went to heaven when they died in the Old Testament. Nobody could save them. The law of sin and death, the, the Levitical laws, were nailed to the cross. That's what it's talking about in Colossians chapter 2. Holy day, Sabbath day, new moon, ordinances. It was nailed to the cross. Remember, the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. A little side note there. For to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. The new creature in Christ Jesus. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enemy thereby. And came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that are nigh, the Jews and the Gentiles. But notice there, the big key there is having no hope and without God in the world. That's what the lost world is. That's not what we are. We were that way one time. We had no hope. I was a false convert for most of my life. And when God truly saved me again, that's when I found true hope. That's when I really had God in here, the Holy Spirit, by going through the true plan of salvation that leads to you being a new creature in Christ Jesus. The, the new life that, that leads to, that's about sanctification. And we're going to get to that. Romans 8.35, we read, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecutions, or famines, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Once again, we are sealed unto the day of redemption. That blessed hope. The helmet for a hope of salvation. It's not talking about getting saved at the cross, what's it talking about? Okay, the hope of salvation. Let me read one more, 1 Thessalonians 4.14. 1 Thessalonians 4.14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Don't worry, we'll meet each other again. If I die before the catching away of the body of Christ and you guys have to keep going, we'll meet again. That blessed hope. Verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of, our, of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of our Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord." And I've taught this, okay, when, we're going to get to the one about the moment in the blink of an eye, okay? When, we be, when this corruption shall put on incorruption, that's going to happen like that. But this is going to be a, a take time event that the whole world's going to see. People going up. Okay. But here's an important part, verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Is it a comfort if Paul's like, it's not going to happen in our lifetime? Is that a comfort? No. The next generation, not going to happen in your lifetime. Is that a comfort? No. Paul did not say that it's not going to happen in my lifetime. Did it happen in Paul's lifetime? No. Did it happen in the next generation? No. But Paul didn't say, well, it's not, it's not, it's not going to happen in your lifetime. No, he told you that you're supposed to be looking. You're supposed to be watching and being sober. You're supposed to be watching. Could happen any day now. 
Okay? What does it mean to put on the helmet for a hope of salvation? What does it actually mean? We've talked about this before. Turn to Titus chapter 2. What is that blessed hope? Okay, the helmet for a hope of salvation. I'm getting ahead of myself because we're going to talk about the blessed hope. Um, the helmet for a hope of salvation. Okay, it's the catching away of the body of Christ. You're supposed to have it on. You're supposed to be watching. Another thing about helmets, some of the old helmets, the war helmets, had a part here that goes about the nose. It's got a part here on the side and a part here on the side, and it helped you focus on your target. You didn't get distracted from this over here. You don't get distracted from this over here. You stay focused on your target. Right. Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Titus 2.13, we read, Looking for that blessed hope. And I've said this before, brothers and sisters Christ, looking is an action. It's a present tense action. If you don't believe Jesus Christ can come back any day, you're not going to be looking present tense. You're going to take your eyes off Jesus Christ and put it on the world. Looking for that blessed hope. And the gl glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. People will try it like the easy believism, oh, I'm redeemed right now from all iniquity. I can sin all I want. This says he's, when he comes back, we'll be redeemed from all iniquity. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us, future tense, from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. I still have to deal with this body of flesh. I'm still under the law of sin. Verse 15. These things speak and exhort, and rebuke with all authority, let no man despise thee. Okay? Looking, present tense. I'm This video, I'll rebuke all the preachers that have turned their back on the imminent return of Jesus Christ coming back any day now, I rebuke you. Looking, present tense, we're supposed to be a soldier at your post watching for that day to come. If it doesn't happen in our lifetime, it doesn't happen in our lifetime. But we're supposed to watch and we're supposed to live as if it could happen in our lifetime. What does it mean to be looking for that blessed hope? I've said this before. Go back to verse 1 in Titus chapter 2, verse 1. What does it mean to look for that blessed hope? But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. I got brethren that are turning their back on doctrine, minor doctrine, and eventually it's going to turn into major doctrine. Okay, it's always, it's nature of perversion. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. It starts with minor things, small things, and it's going to get to the major things. Okay, but speak thou of these things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober. What did we just read over here? But let us watch and be sober. Let, therefore let us not sleep as others, but let us watch and and be sober. Part of looking for that blessed hope over here is to let the aged man be sober, grave, temperate, sound in the faith, in charity, in patience. The aged woman likewise that they be that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober. To love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. The young men likewise exhort to be sober. That's very important. How do you know when a man, of God, man or woman of God is not sober anymore? I say woman of God, but a brother and sister in Christ is not sober anymore. They've taken their eyes off Jesus Christ. They're not looking for that blessed hope anymore. They're not being sober. They exhort to be sober-minded. And all things showing themselves a pattern of good works. A pattern of good works. There's a change in your life. It's supposed to be expected. 
And those works need to be based off Scripture. And doctrine showing uncorruptness. There's some brethren that are getting corrupted in minor doctrine, and when you get to the major doctrine, it's going to slowly filter its way up to the major doctrines. Gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed. Having no evil thing to say of you. I always try to emphasize the shame part. When you get someone who starts showing hypocrisy where they taught one thing and now they're teaching something else, or they say one thing and now they're saying something else, or they say one thing and do something else, but that's, that's not sound speech. Okay, cussing, we automatically try to throw it in when it comes to bad language. You need to have sound speech, you need to have sound speech, but you also need to not be double-tongued. Okay, say one thing and then say another. You need to have sound speech that cannot be condemned and that you may not be ashamed. Having no evil thing to say of you. Verse 9, exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. Men have to work out in the world. Okay. Not prolonging, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. We read about that. Jews and Gentiles. We get adopted in. Verse 12. Teaching us that denying all this that we're reading everything, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly. What does it mean by living soberly? We're to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. He comes, he can come back any day now. We keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. We stay sober. What happens when you don't when, when you take your eyes off Jesus Christ? You become drunken spiritually. You get messed up spiritually and sometimes physically. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Notice that there's no period at the end of verse 12. It's a dot comma. They're taking two sentences that mean the same thing. They're on the same, I mean, on the same topic and putting it together. There's no period. So in this present world, looking for that blessed hope. You've got brethren that are coming out and they're taking their helmets off and they're trying to motivate the brethren to take their helmets off. Oh, Jesus is not coming back for another five or ten years. And you know what? Two hundred years ago, Jesus couldn't have come back. Five hundred years ago, Jesus couldn't have come back. A thousand years ago, Jesus couldn't have come back. Now here's the thing, brother, says Christ, that's very dangerous, and you need to repent if you've ever said that. You need to repent big time. It's one thing to say that 200 years ago, Jesus didn't come back. He decided that that wasn't the time he wanted to come back. That's absolute truth, and you're stating a fact. 500 years ago, Jesus didn't come back. It wasn't the time. Jesus said that's not the time. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you say Jesus couldn't have come back, now you're trying to play God. And you're trying to tell God what he can and can't do. This is where I'm going to go off a little bit, on a not a tangent, but go off a little bit, brother, says Christ. It's very dangerous. I went on the computer, it's right here, and I started looking up some of our technology that we have. Do you know it was like 1880 or 1890 is when they patented the actual automobile, but the automobile didn't actually come out for everybody to have until 1930, I think it was, when I was looking on it. It might be off by 10 years, but 1930. The point I'm making, I looked up the refrigerator, the first refrigerator. I looked up this technology, that technology. Do you realize all the grand technology that we have today? Cell phones, this speaker, the tablet, um, all this technology that we have today, it's not... It's, it's less than 100 years old, a lot of it. Maybe 120, something, I forget, we're, we're in 2021 or 22, but it's 120 years old. That's it. And if you look at the history of mankind, going back to, and in, in the Bible, but back to the death of Jesus Christ to today, who do you think has been holding off technology? Who do you think has been holding off the world from coming together? 
Don't you remember the Tower of Babel? Where Jesus said, it's not good for men to come together like this, because now there's nothing will stop them. They'll put their minds together. And there's nothing that they can't accomplish that, that they set their mind to. And then he, he made it where they all start speaking different known languages and spread them out throughout the world. Oh, well, yeah. People say, well, Jesus could have come back 200 years ago. Yes, he could have. It only takes less than 100 years to shoot the technology up. It takes God lefting it off and saying, okay, I've been holding back technology. I mean, for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, people used horses. It wasn't since 1930 when it became, I know there were some automobiles before that, but I'm talking about when it became uh, available to the public as a whole, 1930. Before that, the public was using horses for thousands of years. If God wanted to come back 200 years ago, he would have been like, okay, I'm going to let the world unite, and I'm going to let technology shoot through the roof. I mean, think about that. Why didn't the, the UN that we have today, why didn't we have the UN 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago? Because God kept distracting them with wars, petty wars, fighting over things, gold, love of money, this, that. Natural disasters. Brothers and sisters in Christ, are you following me a little bit at least? Hopefully a little bit. If God wanted to come back 200 years ago, all he had to do was say, before that, like 100 years before that, so if he wanted to come back 200 years ago, you go back 300 years ago, and God doesn't need me to try to justify him. If God wants to come back, he'll find a way. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Abraham, oh, you're going to have a child in your old age. I, I, I'm not going to have a child in my old age. Look how old I am. Is it, and by, This is God saying this. Is anything too hard for the Lord? What about all the miracles? What are all the wonderful things God has done? Is anything too hard for the Lord? And I'm trying to give you an example. He wants to come back 200 years ago to catch the way to happen 200 years ago. About 100 to 150 years before that, he'd lift the ban on technology and let technology shoot through the roof. He'd let the nations become one. Jesus Christ could come back any day. It's so easy to look back and say, okay, Jesus didn't come back in that time period. But what some of the brethren are doing is they're falling into the trap of trying to play God. You can be as gods, knowing good and evil. You're trying to play God. God couldn't have come back 200 years ago. Yes, he could have. If he wanted to, he would have set everything up the way he's setting up things today. And we see what's going on out there. The way he's setting it up today, he would have done it 200 years ago. He would have done it 500 years ago if that's what he wanted. He would have done it 1,000 years ago if that's what he wanted. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Once again, technology. It's exploded in less than 100 years. And God has for Now we have the technology for the mark of the beast. God is still setting things up. We still might be here for a while. Or God could call us home while I'm doing this video. God could call us home. What's the whole point, getting back to the study, what's the whole point of looking for that blessed hope? It's the life that you live for Jesus Christ. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope. There's no period. Looking for that blessed hope. When you start acting like, well, Jesus isn't going to come back any day now. I don't believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. It's going to reflect on the life that you live. I've seen brethren turn their back on it and look at the life they're living. Compared to how they lived before when they believed Jesus Christ could come back any day now. They were on fire for the Lord. They aren't so much today. I'm on fire to try to warn you, brother, sister, Christ. Don't let brethren that have fallen away grab you and drag you down. Keep that helmet on for a hope of salvation. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ with the life that you're living. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, we read, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affection on things above, not on things of this earth. 
What did we start this study out with? It says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who have chosen him to be a soldier. What gets in the way if you put on the whole armor of God? The affairs of this life. Look what it sucks here. We're supposed to set our affection on things above and not on things of this earth. You have some brethren that are doing that. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members. Until we get there, we're supposed to be living a life of Christ. That's what it means to be looking for that blessed hope. I've talked about this before, brothers and sisters Christ. I like to set out on the deck. I like the clouds, because the Bible talks about we'll be, meet them in the air and be with them in the clouds. When I see clouds out there, I'm always asking the Lord, is today the day? But that's not what the Bible's talking about when it says looking. It's talking about with the life that you're living. Okay? Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. I say that with distinction because of what's been going on in the body of Christ last month. Covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. That's not for us, brothers and sisters Christ. We're supposed to have our thoughts on things above. That's why we talk about the, the judgment seat of Christ. Nothing in this world, I repeat, nothing physical in the things of this world, the ways of this world, nothing is more important than you keeping your eyes on Jesus Christ and keeping that helmet for a hope of salvation on. Nothing's more important than your walk with the Lord. Nothing's more important than the Word of God. Nothing's more important if you're a young man in ministry. Nothing's more important than fellowship with the brethren. Remember what Paul said, If meat make my brother to offend, I'll eat no meat while the world standeth. Eating meat isn't a sin. But Paul was saying that when it comes to witnessing for, for Jesus Christ, to lead people to Christ, things of this world is not import, more important than that. When it comes to fellowship with brethren, there's things in this world that aren't more important than that. Okay. But we're supposed to keep our eyes on things above. Remember we said looking for that blessed hope. I always say keeping our eyes on Jesus. Keeping our eyes on Jesus. Where's Jesus Christ right now? Getting ahead of myself, but he's in heaven right now. Doing what? Preparing a place for us? Oh yeah. 2 Corinthians 5.8 2 Corinthians 5.8 uh -huh. I'm in 1 Corinthians, forgive me. I make that mistake a lot when there's more than one book. 2 Corinthians 5.8 2 Corinthians 5.8 We are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Can I get an amen on that? How many of us are getting weary from the fight? How many of us are getting tired? Well, the Bible says that God will renew our strength, that we can do all things through Christ which, strength, who, which strengtheneth me. But there's days, Lord, brothers and sisters Christ, I want to be with God. I talk to Him about it. It's like, I want to be with you, Lord. I know I'm here for a reason, to encourage the brethren and be encouraged by the brethren. But there are days that I want to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. Brother Jesus Christ, I'm going to point you to the book and talk to you about sanctification. Are you praying? The Bible says pray without ceasing. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God. Are you hiding God's word in your heart? 
Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Are you reading your Bibles every day? Are you studying your Bibles every day? Are you living what God tells you to do from the Bible? Are you doing it? Why? Because we will all have to answer for it at the judgment seat of Christ. That's why you're supposed to be looking at things above. Okay, I can have everything I could possibly want down here and have almost nothing up there, or I can have a lot of things up there and almost have nothing down here. What's it going to be? Okay. Colossians 3.12 says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, Forbearing one another, forgiving one another. I've made some mistakes in my time. And I've had to ask brethren for forgiveness. Sometimes they forgive me, sometimes they won't. But the Bible says we're supposed to be forgiving one another. Okay? Forbearing one another. If, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. I've already forgiven. I've got brothers that have stabbed me in the back I, that I believe are saved. i got brethren that have turned against me. But I've already forgiven them. Okay? I don't hold anger and hatred and bitterness towards them. Even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Don't get me wrong. i got my guard up. And they still need to repent. They need to change. But I don't hold bitterness and hate towards them. Verse 4, and above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. The peace of God, you know how to have peace in your heart? You hide God's word in your heart. The precious promises, the blessed hope. That's how you have peace in your heart. And let the peace of God rule in your heart, to the which also ye are called in one body. I mean, we're reading the Word of God, and it says here you need to have charity. So you can have peace in your heart. But it says, and let the peace of God rule. Remember, God is the one that's supposed to rule. He's the final authority through His perfect written Word. When God rules your life, and you're obeying Him, He's your commander, He's your chief, He's capital L Lord, He's capital K King, He commands, you obey, you're going to have peace in your life, and joy. And be thankful. Be thankful. Verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's why in verse 15 it says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Then you get to 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. When you realize that God has cleaned up your life greatly, you'll start seeing a lot more peace and joy in your life. Those false converts that are into the easy believism, they don't know what real peace is. They don't know what real joy is. They don't have Jesus in their heart. They don't have God's Word hidden in their heart. They don't believe in a changed life. They can just continue living. The old man can still be alive and kicking. Yeah. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns. I started this out with the hymn. And spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. I've said this time and time again. If you can't do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you shouldn't be doing it. And you've got false converts out there telling you, you can play video games in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. No, you can't. Oh, you can get drunk in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, it's okay to cuss in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's okay to celebrate what I call holidays. Holidays. Holidays in the name of Jesus Christ. If you can't do it in the name of Jesus Christ, you shouldn't be doing it. Period. Okay. If you, get, if you can't give God thanks for it, you shouldn't be doing it. I mean, I've had... Professing brethren tell me that they can give God thanks for the money to buy the alcohol to get drunk. They can thank God for the money to buy the video games. And I can use that, I mean, you can keep going. 
Uh, no, you can't. You can try, but be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, that shall you also reap. God is not mocked. You cannot give God thanks for sin, for lusts of the flesh, for worldly, wicked ways that go against the Scriptures. <coughs> but we see there, the helmet for a hope of salvation. When you believe that Jesus Christ can come back any day, we read all that there. You're going to start living for Jesus Christ every day. What happens when you stop believing that Jesus Christ can come back any, any day? You stop living for Jesus Christ every day. I've seen it. I've seen it in men in ministry. I've seen it in brethren. You stop living for Jesus Christ every day. Looking for that blessed hope. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we're going to get to this, but no man steal your crown. Okay? Believing that the body of Christ is going to leave with words, believing that the body of Christ is going to leave before the time of Jacob's trouble, is not the same thing as looking for that blessed hope. It's not. There's, 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 I've come across lost people that believe in the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble, but they're not saved. Why? Because they've never repented and believed in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Jesus isn't their Lord. And the life that they're living, remember, in word or in deed? Your words and your deeds need to line up. If you truly, truly believe that Jesus Christ is coming back to get us someday, then you're going to get busy for the Lord. And when you have people that say, well, I still believe that Jesus is going to come before the time of Jacob's trouble, but I no longer believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ, their actions show that they don't believe that Jesus is coming back. They're not living every day for the Lord. They're not on fire for the Lord anymore. And I've seen it. So brothers and sisters in Christ, what does it mean to put on the helmet for a hope of salvation? It means that you're looking for Jesus Christ to come back any day with your actions, the life that you're living day to day. It's not just words, it's deed, it's action. And after everything we read there, there's some people that are like, but that's so much work. Brothers and sisters, that, that's, just, that's just too much for God to ask because He knows we're just men and women. We're not gods. There's people that whine and complain. Is this all there is to life, living for the Lord every day through Satan? Is this all there is? Praise the Lord, there is. You know what it is, brothers and sisters of Christ? I believe that sometimes you forget, you forget What's in store for us? Why? Because you took your eyes off Jesus Christ. You're no longer looking and thinking about things above. All you're looking at is what's here. The trouble we had to. We talked about tribulation and going through hard times, persecutions. What shall, who shall, what shall, shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord? 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm going to remind you, brothers and sisters Christ, what we have to look forward to. And when you look at what we have to look forward to, this is nothing. This is nothing. It's, it's, we don't deserve what we're looking forward to. And nothing we do here is going to make us deserve it. But we love the Lord. We belong to the Lord. We are bought with a price, the Bible says. We are His. We belong to Him. Jesus said, Put my, take my yoke upon you. My... Yoke is easy, my burden is light. And think about this. No matter what we go through in this life, brothers and sisters of Christ, it's nothing, nothing compared to what Jesus Christ went through for us. Nothing. We might feel like we're alone, but we're never alone. The Holy Spirit's in us, God is with us all the time. We're never alone. Jesus was alone. Everybody forsaked him. When he got nailed to that cross to take on the sins of the world, because he came against God, manifest in the flesh, came in the likeness of sinful flesh, his body and his soul were still there, but they were severed. Like that spiritual circumcision. They weren't connected. Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That was showing that that connection was severed, but the soul was still in him because Jesus is God fully and completely. 
But imagine us. Could you, I couldn't survive a day being disconnected from Jesus Christ. Our soul, remember that spiritual circumcision, my soul is now connected to Jesus Christ. Can you imagine not being connected to Jesus Christ anymore? I'm not talking about losing salvation. I'm talking about Jesus going, okay, I'm going to, take, I'm going to go a day where I'm going to cut you off and let you go for 24 hours by yourself. And then we'll connect again. Could you handle that? Could you imagine? I couldn't handle it. We have never been alone. Jesus says he's always with us. He'll never leave you. He will never forsake you. Brother and sister Christ, what did Jesus do for us on the cross? That's the biggest thing to think about. But I'm going to throw in some of the things about what we're looking forward to at the catching way of the body of Christ for this study. Looking for that blessed hope. 1 Corinthians 2.6 Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. Remember, we're supposed to keep our eyes on things above. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. I tr 100% recommend the book that Brother JT did on the Lord of Glory. I have it. It's a great book. Mm -hmm. Verse 9. But it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man, the lost world, I'll tell you why in a second, man, the things which God hath prepared for them that love, the, that love him. I'm sorry, I said love for That love him. When you first get saved, you're newly saved, you couldn't even fathom anything. I couldn't have. But, verse 10, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. That's what the point I was trying to get. God's going to reveal it to us. We don't know. When you're, The lost world has no clue about heaven. Uh, we try to tell them about hell, but they, they, they're still acting clueless about hell. They don't have a clue about heaven or hell. But God reveals that to us by His Spirit. When you get saved, God's going to let you know about some things about heaven. He's going to let us know some things about hell, but today we're talking about heaven. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yet the deep things of God. For it is written, I have not seen, nor ear had heard, neither had entered into the heart of man, the things which God hath prepared for him. What are some of those things that God has prepared for us? Well, in John 14, 1, this is Jesus telling us, giving us a little bit of what God's preparing for us, because Jesus is God. It says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, because Jesus is God. In my Father's house are many mansions. I've said this before, my Father's house, the third heaven, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Jesus is preparing, preparing a place for us. And that place that he's preparing for us makes anything you've seen down here, the richest of the rich, the, the rich and sh they call it the rich and shameless. We joke around by saying the rich and shameless, because they are. They glory in their shame. The Bible talks about it. Whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame. But the rich and famous and everything, all those places are, are outhouses compared to what we got up there. They're nothing. Okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Second Corinthians twelve one. It is not expedient for me, Dallas, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ, and I believe this is this is Paul talking, but I believe it's Paul this experience. I knew a man in Christ about fourteen years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. 
The soul in heaven, remember, we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. A soul can be in two places at once, here and up there. And our body can't see what our soul sees. But I believe Paul, when he was stoned, he got the glimpse of what his soul sees. That's what I believe is going on here. I can't tell, God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. We just read up there about Jesus saying, in my Father's house. It's talking about the third heaven. That's where Jesus is. That's where God the Father, the soul, is on the throne, taking care of everything all the time. God the Father, the soul, is on the throne at all times, and it's in Jesus Christ at all times, except there was separation when he died on the cross. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will glory, to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. How many of you brothers and sisters of Christ out there are having hard, hard times, financially, physically? You know what you got waiting for you? Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. But you know what you got waiting for you? Living a life of Christ. There's paradise waiting for you. Jesus prepared a place for you up there that's just yours. Right? Many mansions. Of such one I will glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. I won't act like the lost world. For I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. Paradise, brothers and sisters of Christ. That's what we got waiting for us. Why would you take your eyes off Jesus Christ and say, Nah, he's not coming back any day. Remember we kept reading, Encourage one another with these words. Exhort one another with these words. Talking about the catching away of the body of Christ. It can happen any day. That's the encouragement. To live for Jesus Christ every day. Pardon me. Every day. And you got brethren that are, are, have, have taken their helmet off for a hope of salvation. Oh, I still believe in the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. I'm just not looking for that blessed hope anymore. That's what's going on. Now, we learn Revelation. I understand this is the city that's coming down, but the city's up there where we're going. Let's read this. Revelation 21.9. This is John gets to see it. So we read about how Paul got to see it. We read about how Jesus is taught about preparing a place for us. Now John gets a glimpse of it. Revelation 21.9. Revelation 21.9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride the Lamb's wife, us, the Bride of Christ. Verse 10, And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven of God. Now remember as we're reading this, that we got adopted in. Remember he preached to those that are afar off and those that are nigh. We've been adopted in. We've been grafted in. Spiritual circumcision made without hands. Having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious. Even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now I watched, I walk on the beach, I look for stones, I look for agates. Agates is the biggest thing I look for. I look for sea glass that's all different colors and it shines in the light, especially when it's wet and it's been smoothed out by the water. So I, I can kind of picture some of these stones. If not, you can look some of these stones up and what they look like when they're in perfect, pristine condition. Most diamonds don't look like much until you cut them and you polish them to where they shine. But these, wow. And all the walls, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, 
and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel, on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve fountains, foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Wait, wait, wait. I got one guy on me who was trying to say that when I was talking about, this is a side note, when I was talking my study about um, Acts, I think it was Acts 2, where uh, one or two, where Paul's like, we need to have another apostle. We need to have another apostle. And, he, and, they, and they got on to me and said he was numbered among the twelve, but he wasn't numbered among the twelve by God, he was numbered among the twelve by them. Okay, they cast lots. They didn't ask God saying out of the hundred, uh, the, the study was 120 or two, because there was 120 brethren there that qualified, that could have been an apostle, but they came down to his respecter of persons. They got it down to two people and said, God, you have to choose between these two people. We know that who the eleven apostles are. The one apostle by transgression fell. We know who that is. Son of perdition. And we know that Paul replaced that twelfth apostleship. Here it shows there's only twelve apostles, not thirteen. That man was not an apostle. But that was just a, sorry for the rabbit trail. But it says here, and then the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. There's only twelve. There's no apostles today. Okay, if anybody thought, says they're an apostle today, they're a liar. And he that talketh with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lieth foursquare, and the length is, a, is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed twelve thousand forloins. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And, the, and he measured the wall thereof a hundred and forty and four cubits according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel." And the building of the wall of, the, of it was jasper. And the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. Can't even fathom what pure gold that's so pure that it's like glass. Can't even fathom it. We try to. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all matter of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third uh, chad chadonim probably pronouncing that wrong, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardin, sardin, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, and the tenth a chrysosperus, the eleventh a jaseth, the twelfth an ameth, amethyst. Okay. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it was transparent. And I saw no temple therein. Why? For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. We get to see Jesus Christ face to face. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we get to see Jesus Christ face to face. Brother Chris, it doesn't matter how bad things are getting here on earth and how dark it is getting out there. We're to live for Jesus Christ every day. That's why I did that Bible reading to encourage you, brothers and sisters Christ, that it doesn't matter what is going on in the world, how wicked the world's getting. We're to live for Jesus Christ every day because someday we're going to get to go see him face to face. There's no temple and they're the light thereof. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. I was looking at the moon tonight. I was out there earlier. The moon shines. But there's no need of the moon or the sun. Why? For the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. The Lamb is the light thereof. Now, we just read through all that. When we got reinforced, we got a great home. God's got a great home. And we're going to be serving the Lord zealous. Remember, He's going to redeem us from all iniquity. And we're going to be zealous of good works. We're going to be doing good works for the Lord for all eternity. We're going to be serving Him for all eternity. And we're going to be together praising the Lord. Don't complain about what God's asking us to do today. It's nothing compared to what's waiting for us. I'll... I, I, I got to keep reminding myself, stay on track. 
Don't fall away. Yes, it's hard. Yes, the persecution, the tribulation. Some of, some of the brethren out there are living very poor. Uh, some of the brethren out there are being pros uh, persecuted by people at work, by neighbors and everything. Brothers, when you get prosecuted, uh, prosecuted, uh, persecuted, persecuted, and if you go before court and get prosecuted for being a Christian, but persecuted, you're supposed to be praising the Lord and singing to the Lord and giving Him praise. When Paul was beaten, they praised the Lord. When he was imprisoned, he would be singing hymns in the prison. There are some brethren that are getting frustrated and angry. I'm going through all this persecution. Praise the Lord. Those are rewards in heaven. How you react will determine those rewards in heaven. If you set a bad example for a Christian and how you respond, it's a different story. But when you're persecuted for being a Christian and standing for this book and living the way this book says we're supposed to and you're a light unto the world and you suffer persecution for it, those are rewards. All right. Now everything we just read there, you want to know something? I can't fathom it. I talk to the Lord about it. The lost world likes to steal from the Bible, and they try to copy it, and they try to, f to figure out what heaven looks like and everything, and they still can't even come close to what heaven's really like. Okay? They can't even come close. But this isn't what gets me really excited. You know what really gets me excited about the catching away of the body of Christ? Why I look for it every day with the life that I live, because that's what the Bible tells us to do? Turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 51. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. A lot of you know this one. Okay? It says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For this trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. How many of you, brothers and sisters of Christ, yes, you're getting persecuted. Yes, life can get hard out there. But what is the number one thing you're so sick and tired of doing? Warring with this flesh. This wicked, sinful flesh. How many times has this flesh got you to fail the Lord in your walk with the Lord? How many times did this flesh get your eyes off Jesus Christ? Pull you away from His Word? Got you to fail the Lord? This flesh, how, how often did this flesh get you to fail the brethren? Oh yeah, I, I, the number one thing I'm looking forward to is... This right here, 53. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. No more getting... You know how you hear people saying, I'm getting so hot, it's killing me? You never have to worry about getting too hot ever again, or getting too cold. People dying of frostbite. If anybody's ever had frostbite, it's a horrible feeling. Anybody who's dying of heat exhaustion, I had a heat stroke in the, in the military. It's not. It's no picnic. Okay, and getting tired, getting hungry. We won't have to deal with any of that anymore. But more importantly, this wicked, sinful flesh is no longer going to pull us down. When this, don't get me wrong. When this sinful flesh gets me to fail the Lord, it's my fault. That's why you need to repent. Sorrow of the heart. You need to repent. It's my fault. But how many times are we sick and tired of this battle that we have to put down the flesh every day? You have to, brother says Christ. If you don't put down the flesh every day, it's going to creep up on you and, 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 and pull you away from the Lord. Verse 40, 54. So when this corruption shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. The law is nailed to the cross. Colossians 2. Verse 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, knowing what's in store for us, brothers, 
We have to struggle with this flesh. That's what it says right here. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. Remember we talked about the judgment seat of Christ, the rewards. God's preparing a place for you. What we suffer today is nothing compared to what we're going to experience for all eternity. What the Bible says we're going to suffer, that's why I'm pointing at the Bible. Living the life of Christ today, no matter how much we suffer, it's nothing compared to what we're going to spend eternity. But there's two reasons that I say that for me, this is nice over here. We talked about heaven and gave a little bit. I still think there's so much to heaven that we can't fathom. There's still so much about what we're going to get up there and see so much that we didn't know because we couldn't fathom it. When this, because we are, we're attached to this body of wicked flesh that's holding us down. We can't fathom it. Our soul's up there. Our soul sees it all. But our body can't. It's, it's holding us back. So we can't see it. We can't understand what's going on up there. Remember, we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now. Soul can be in two places at once. But the other reason is lately I've had brethren pray and say, the one thing I can't stand, I'm getting so tired of the division in the body of Christ. Think of this, brothers and sisters of Christ. The Bible says, we already talked about this in a previous study, that we're supposed to be of the same mind and we're supposed to be of the same judgment. When this corruption shall put on incorrupt or this this corruption, see if I can write it, see it right, for this corruption must put on incorruption, we're all gonna have the mind of Christ. We're supposed to have a little bit of the mind of Christ right now. He lets us know some things. But when we get up there, we're definitely going to have the mind of Christ fully and completely. No more pride. No more pride that leads to contention. No more contention. That contention that leads to respecter of persons. No more respecter of persons. What does that lead to? Division. No more division. How many you want, how many you want the, the, the catching away of the body of Christ to happen tomorrow? Raise your hands. We need to keep continue living every day as if Jesus Christ could come back tomorrow. We don't know when he's going to come back, brothers and sisters Christ. But there's going to come a day where we get to go to heaven in an incorruptible body to live in paradise with our Savior, Jesus Christ with the brethren, and we're all going to be united for the first time. I'm sorry, but for the first time. The, I don't believe, if you listen to how what Paul went through, through all the Pauline epistles, he's fighting the Jewish people coming in, trying to destroy the gospel, trying to destroy the Christians that get saved and mess up their walk with the Lord. There's always division. There's always division of some kind. There's always something going on. For the first time, we will be one mind. Of one mind and of one, of the same mind and of the same judgment. There will be no division. There will be no more debates that's a sin, no more arguments. We will all be on the same page. I keep pushing that we need to do that today because that's what God tells me I'm supposed to do. It's what Paul says by Jesus Christ that we are supposed to be on the same page today. But the whole body of Christ has never actually been on the same page like we're supposed to be. But someday we will. That's what I look forward to more than anything. This is great. Can't fathom it. It's great. There's hardships I have here. I'm starting to get old. I'm starting to have pains. I look forward to having a body where there's no pains anymore. But the biggest thing I'm looking for is not having to struggle with the flesh anymore. When you get to a point that for all eternity... I couldn't even fathom having to put this flesh down for all eternity. I'd, I'd go nuts. I'd go insane. We don't have to put this flesh down for all eternity. We're going to get a body that doesn't hold us down. An incorruptible body. And the brethren are going to come together and we're going to be one. And we're going to all be serving our Lord Jesus Christ for all eternity. Worshiping Him for all eternity together. We're going to be striving together, which we're supposed to be doing today. We're going to be doing that for all eternity. Brothers and sisters in Christ, don't forget that. Don't forget what's in store for us. What God has in store for us. What He told us that we have in store for us. 
Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ by the life that you're living. Stand for this book. Don't let pride come in. Don't let contentions come in. Don't be respecter of persons. We'll be doing a video here in the future where I'm going to, we're going to list some things that I believe is really hurting the body of Christ in these last days. Pride is one of them that leads to contentions. But respecter of persons is a big one. Instead of this being your final authority in all matters of faith and practice, you're starting to become respecter of persons. And it doesn't matter what this says. All you care about is what that person says. But anyway, we're going to get into some of that in future studies. But brothers and sisters of Christ, this is what you need to hide in your heart. This is what you need to hide in your heart. And you need to live it. And you need to make sure that you're not letting anybody get you down and pull you away from this book. That's trying to get you to go the way of the world. Remember we talked about a soldier. People, they're taking bullets. These bullets are ways of the world, ways of the world. And this person, this brother in Christ, didn't have his shield out. Someone talked him into taking down his shield and taking off his helmet. Just took a headshot. Well, what do we do, brother? Says Christ. Here's the med kit, right here. Here's the med kit. We take it over to the soldier. And say, okay, correction, rebuke. No, I don't want the medicine. Okay, you leave him there. You go to somebody else that got downed on the on the battlefield. Here's the medicine to repent, to get him back up and get him back into the fight. And you keep going, to, and you can only help those that will, will adhere to the Word of God. That'll take the medicine. So that, that worldliness, Lord, I'm sorry, I repent, that bullet falls out, and God picks him back up, puts him back together. Now get that shield back on, and don't you put it down. Put that helmet for a hope of salvation back on, and don't take it off. Get back into the fight. That's where we're at in these last days, brother and sister Christ. We're, I'm, I'm fighting so hard to get you, brother and sister Christ, to keep the whole armor. You're supposed to put on the whole armor of God every day. Okay. Every day. Make sure you have the whole armor of God on every day. Make sure you're doing walking that walk and living for Jesus Christ. I'm going to end with this. Two things. You don't have to turn here, just I just want you to listen. Okay. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. People are taking off their helmet for a hope of salvation. People are taking off their shield. Shield is usually the first thing you put down, so then everything else comes through and starts taking you out. You're not putting on the breastplate of righteousness, the feet shod with the preparation of peace, the sword. You're not keeping your sword sharp. You're not hiding this in your heart anymore, some of the brethren. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich. You care more about what's down here and not about up there. I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked? You say, brother, why are you reading this to us? Are we forgotten who we were, our lost state? Have we forgotten that the old man is dead and buried for a reason? That we're supposed to be living every day for the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you forgotten what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. Your state before you got saved. Notice here it says you were that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And remember what we read? Without hope and without God in the world. I couldn't fathom that anymore. I've been saved for seven years. I know you can't lose your salvation, but I can't fathom that. I never want to go back to that. To be without hope and without God in the world? Back to being wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked? I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. You want to earn gold in heaven? Riches in heaven? The judgment seat of Christ? The Word of God will tell you how. 
Gold tried in the fire, that thou mayst be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayst be clothed, and that thy shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayst see. As much as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Brethren, it's not because I hate you. I don't hate you. I love you. That's why you rebuke and chasten. As many as I love, I rebuke and God chastens. I'm sorry. God does the chasing. But why do we rebuke? Why do we correct people to get you back on the right track? To remind you of who you were before and you don't want to be that person ever again. You're the new creature in Christ Jesus. I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, for what we're talking about here, Philip Newton, come up hither. I'll come into him and sup with him. I know it's also talking about salvation, but for this, what we're talking about here, how many of us want to hear that voice? If any man hear my voice, and will sup with him, and he with me, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. That was Revelation 3.14. Revelation 3.11 reads, Behold, I come quickly. Quickly. Hold that fast what thou hast, that no man take thy crown. No man take thy crown. You want to know one of the crown rewards is looking for that blessed hope? But this is Christ, how many of you have been talked into taking that helmet for a hope of salvation off? How many? By brethren that have, by brethren that have taken their helmets off and said, oh, Jesus isn't coming back any day now. Or you've taken your helmet off because the world has got you to take the helmet off. Or you put down that shield and a bullet ricocheted off your helmet and knocked your helmet off because you don't have your shield of faith out. How many of you, brothers and sisters of Christ, I'm here to help you. Get back into the Word of God and it'll, God will put you back together. Repent. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And God will pick you back up, put you back together, and here's the armor of God again. Here you go. Here's your helmet that got knocked off. Put it on. Here's your shield. Don't put this stuff down again. Don't take this the, the armor of God off at all. Get back out in the fight, brothers and sisters of Christ. Get back out there. Spiritual battle. Get back out there and start living for the Lord. Start having a fire for the Lord again. Remember your first love. Get back into the Word of God. Get back into Bible studies hardcore. Make memory verses. Memorize verses. Hide them in your heart. Get back to living for Jesus Christ every day. That's what it means to look for that blessed hope. That's my encouragement for you, brothers and sisters of Christ. That's my heart's desire. I'm not the bad guy and I'm not this mean person because I'm just coming down on you. I'm coming down on this guy first. You second. This guy first. Am I living for the Lord every day? So I'm going to end this study right here, brothers and sisters in Christ. I love my brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why I'm giving you this. This is the most precious physical possession that you have on this earth. Nothing's more important than this, brother and sister Christ. Nothing. Nothing is. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you for taking the time to watch.